next speaker is Dr. Meryl Diamond. She's a managing director of the Diamond Headache Clinic in Chicago, the clinical assistant professor of medicine at the Chicago Medical School, and the Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science in North Chicago, a lecturer of the Department of Neurology at Wyoming University School of Medicine in Naples. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Thank you years ago or so, 
uh, did a study looking at whether or not it was estrogen changes that occurred during the menstrual cycle or progesterone changes that occurred during the menstrual cycle that will predict whether or not you get a headache because those are the two hormones that really shift uh, uh, during your period. And, and, and so the question is, is, is it too much? Is it too little? Is it the change? And, and his study was only done on a few patients. Actually, there were less than 20 patients in the study, which is a little scary because we base most of our knowledge on these 20 women, but, uh, or less. Um, and, and the reality is that in his study, he was able to show that it was actually the fall in estrogen level that predicted the menstrual migraines, not progesterone. And in a way, we've been able to replicate that. A guy named Vince Martin recently did a study that showed that that was true as well. Um, however, in my own practice, I would tell you I occasionally have a progesterone-sensitive woman, and we've been able to test out that theory in, in that patient. But I would tell you the vast majority of time it's the estrogen changes. And it's not the overall level of estrogen. So a lot of patients will come in and say, could you just check my estrogen level? I need you to. To, it must be off or something's wrong with it. And it's not the number, but it's the relative change. So much like with other migraines, which is exacerbated, as Dr. Urban said, by changes in sleep, changes in diet, skipping meals, um, barometric pressure changes, so the word is change here, um, migraine is precipitated by the change in estrogen, either the too rapid of falling of estrogen or the too rapid rise of estrogen most commonly the fall, but in some patients again the rise. And that's why the science is sort of difficult. Um, so when you may ask your provider, you know, why is this happening to me, we don't have real good science on it. It's just not perfect at this point in time. Um, but most of my patients will tell me, you know, Doc, the first day of my cycle at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I know it's hitting. Or, you know, within the first 24 hours of when my cycle begins, I know it's going to happen. Or three days before my cycle, which is when estrogen might start to fall in that particular patient, that's when they can predict their headache. And the best way for patients to be able to demonstrate that, and what's really helpful to me in my practice, is for them to bring a headache diary, you know, some type of calendar. And I had a patient come the other day, she was so cute, she had like three different apps on her phone and um, she had been tracking her migraines on all the apps. And I was like, okay, you're spending way too much time on this. Um, but it actually was really good information because we were, and I don't remember the particular app that she liked the best, but um, we were able to track fairly closely when her hormonal headache hit, that she also had a little bit of a bump at ovulation um, and how well her medication worked. So I think that diary can really be invaluable um, when we're trying to treat. You know, so when a patient comes in and brings me that information, it can help me to tailor their therapy so that I know what's going on with them certainly a lot better. Um, and so, so the issue is, is it truly menstrual migraine? Okay, is that a problem for you? And if it is, what kind of therapy should we do? And so I think, um, Again, what George said earlier about, you know, addressing lifestyle stuff can be very important. Uh, exercising regularly, and of course the last moment you want to exercise is when you're feeling bloated and cramping and not comfortable. But keeping your exercise program going, good hydration, um, excellent sleep habits, and not skipping meals are particularly important around your cycle, but given that, you also need a good therapy. And so, you know, having a medication for your migraine is really important. Um, many of my patients take the class of drugs called the tryptans if they're uh, medically appropriate for it. They don't have heart disease and certainly young women tolerate them. And for some women, that works just fine. You know, they can take their sumatriptan, their rizotriptan, any whatever uh, tryptan they particularly like during that time, and it will often get rid of their headache. Um, for some patients with more resistant menstrually-related migraines, um, the task becomes a little more complicated. Their headaches break through. Um, their medicine doesn't work completely. And in those particular cases, we have to kind of raise the bar and give them some more effective therapies to use. So the reality is sometimes we'll look at focal therapy. 
we might add an anti-inflammatory drug around the cycle. So starting a couple days before the menstrual cycle and through the menstrual cycle, um, a drug like naproxen, or there's a drug called fluorbuprofen. There are a number of different anti-inflammatories you can use. And what you do is you start them a couple days before the predicted headache and take them through the menstrual cycle. And that can make the tryptan work a little bit better. Um, another drug that we often use during this time is dihydroergotamine, or DHE45. can be used with the tryptan, but sometimes because of its long half-life, the amount of time it lasts in the body, because menstrually related migraines tend to be a little bit longer and harder, and most importantly seem to occur and, you know, for a number of days in a row, that particular product may be more effective for that patient. So there are a number of different things we can do to sort of, you know, make those headaches more tolerable. Um, and, and for some patients, we actually have to go to true prevention because they might have four to six days where they're really not functional during that time. And they might have to take a drug preventatively the rest of the month because those headaches land them in bed every month despite our best efforts to find a product that works well for them to prevent. Um, an area of a little bit more controversy, although certainly less controversial than it was, you know, probably two decades ago, is the use of hormones to manage these headaches. And certainly I get that question all the time in my office. If this is from my hormones, you know, changing, what about being on a hormone that stabilizes that situation? Um, what about taking the pill? Or, you know, we always used to say an oral contraceptive, but they come in patches and rings and, you know, you can, I don't know, whatever. You can take them in many different forms. And I think the biggest key with hormones are to ask two specific questions. Question number one is safety, and question number two is, you know, how do we manage outcome? How do we want to look at how this comes out in the end in terms of reducing the number of migraine attacks you have? So let's talk about safety first. Um, Dr. Urban again talked about migraine with aura. We know that patients with migraine overall have a slight increased risk of stroke, and I'm going to emphasize slight because it's slight, very small numbers. If you have migraine with aura, that number is up a little bit. And, and if, you, if you take an estrogen-based product, it thickens your blood. It makes your blood a little um, thicker, sludgier, whatever. And so you're increasing that risk factor a little bit. So you have to weigh those risk factors. The American College of Gynecology, you know, the people, the powers that be who are gynecologists and obstetricians, as well as the American Academy of Neurology have a, a statement that if you have migraine with aura, you should never take an estrogen-based compound. I think they say a pill, but it should be estrogen-based compound. Um, and I think that's personally as a clinician, somebody who treats patients a little bit rigid, um, because I see a lot of 18 to 25-year-old women where if I take away their hormones, actually the risk of pregnancy is way, way higher, and the things that can happen in pregnancy, way, way higher than the risk of taking that estrogen-based compound. But you have to talk to the patients about risk factors. Um, so who might be safe to use uh, a contraceptive with estrogen, who has aura, um, somebody who doesn't have a lot of family risk factors. Clearly somebody who doesn't smoke. And I tell my patients who, well I tell my patients not to smoke, no matter what. But, I'm kind of rude that way. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but if you want to take an estrogen based compound, you might as well play Russian roulette. That's really what I tell people because it's really dangerous. You know, it just increases your risk factor so dramatically. So if I have a patient who's even a young patient who wants to be on the pill and insists on smoking, you know, I, I really encourage them very strongly. In fact, it's the first words out of my mouth when I said, hey, quit smoking yet. And I certainly wouldn't prescribe the pill to that patient or, or the patch or the ring. <laughs> um, so that's the safety factor, and that's first and foremost. And the question is, what's the cut cutoff age? Um, and again, you know, early 30s to me is about it for, for an estrogen-based compound. 
Um, so when I see a patient back who's 32 or 33 and they've been on the pill um, or some other base compound and, and I start to talk to them about other forms of birth control at that point in time because I just think that cutoff age of around 34 or 35, which of course I wish I was again, um, is a good age to, to change that. Um, and, and of course, if somebody is on the pill and they've never had aura before, I always caution them about the development of aura, please let me know uh, immediately. And then the second thing is if you have migraine with aura and you go on an estrogen-based compound, do your auras change? So those are sort of the warning signs um, and, and they're very, very important. So let's say you're appropriate for going on hormones. What, what's the goal here? Well, the goal here is can it help stabilize my estrogen level and actually help me? And the answer is these days, yes, some patients do better on, on hormones. So in the old days, 20 to 30 years ago, the pills had a ton more estrogen in them. They were just very high concentration estrogen. So almost anybody who took the pill decades ago got migraines. Even if they'd never had migraines before, it often induced headache. The newer combinations of pills tend not to do that. So only a third of patients, about 33%, will get migraines from taking an estrogen-based pill. And you know that means a good percentage don't. And actually, a third of patients do better with the pill. So a, what I always tell patients, again, is let's look at your headache diary. This is the option that you want to go through. Let's look at your headache diary. Let's see what happens outcome-wise. And then, of course, now they have pills that you can take continuously for several months and not have a cycle. I've had some gynecologists tell me that you never have to have a cycle. I'm not sure about that or how comfortable it would be. But the reality is that um, you can go on for several months and just cycle periodically. So actually, you could have maybe two or three menstrual cycles a year and only have to deal with your menstrual migraine during that time. Um, but again, looking at outcome, and, and one of the things I always do when I see a new patient in my office who is on hormones, be it a young kid, you know, a middle-aged woman or an elderly person, is what was the impact of those hormones when they put you on it? Because it's, you know, it's unclear sometimes could the hormones have made things worse in the first place. So it's always important just like we look at other drugs and their impact on headache to look at hormones as well. Um, and so that's another way to manage menstrual migraine, and it can be very, very helpful. Um, I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about pregnancy and migraine. I see a lot of patients in my practice because I treat young women who are anticipating pregnancy um, and, and you know, want to know about the impact of their disease. Sorry, that's what I get for playing with stuff. Their impact of their disease. Um, you know, when they get pregnant, how am I going to treat it? Is it okay for me to do this? Is it safe? Um, what's likely to happen to my migraines? So again, women with hormonally based headaches, menstrually related migraine often get better in pregnancy. That's not 100% guarantee, but certainly it helps. Women who have chronic migraine, that chronic daily headache that Dr. Urban was talking about, don't always get better during pregnancy. And so what I try to do is have a plan in place that's helpful. Um, and it doesn't always work perfectly because each pregnancy can be different in each particular patient. Um, but, you know, what medications can I take if I get a migraine? Should I be off my preventative therapies? Um, I certainly stress non-drug therapies, diet, sleep, biofeedback, regular exercise, um, you know, meditation, yoga, the, all the different kind of non-drug therapies that can be helpful for patients. But in the end, we also need to have safe medications that we can use for when we do have an attack. And drugs in pregnancy are graded A, B, C, D, and X. And as you can imagine, X is bad, D is not so good, and we avoid it. And most of our medications are level Cs. Most of our preventative drugs in migraine, most of our acute drugs in migraine, um, in fact, the only A drug that we use at all in migraine, and patients might kill me if I told them to do this, is Tylenol or acetaminophen, um, because it's not terribly effective for a full-blown migraine. But it is a category A drug, 
for what it's worth. But there are numerous other medications that are Bs, many that are Cs, which we have a lot of experience with. And I actually use a genetic pharmacologist at a local university here to help me navigate for patients who do need medications. So there's places to ask the questions so that we can help patients do this safely. Um, because for some patients, it's not okay not to have a medicine available. But what we want is something that's safe for mom and safe for um, the, the baby as well. Um, and then when we move on to think about breastfeeding, um, it's important to remember that all the drugs that we take orally, at least some proportion of them can be in your breast milk. But for example, a few of our tryptans, sumatriptan, which is the old Imatrex, and zonatriptan, the old Zonag, their concentration in breast milk is extremely low. And so if patients want to use this medication in breastfeeding, they could, or they could actually pump and dump their next feeding if they needed to. Um, so there are numerous ways to sort of get around this and, and, and treat it effectively and be able to live your life normally. I think the most important thing about pregnancy with our patients is to give people a plan um, and have them feel confident that they're safe in their plan. And there's nothing about pregnancy in a migraine nerve that is riskier than in anybody else. So that's really, really important. It is also important to remember that about 13 to 15 percent of women will get their first migraine attack with pregnancy. So that's sort of interesting and a challenge a little bit because you know, we are worried about imaging these patients. You know, do they need an MRI or a CAT scan? Um, certainly, we wouldn't do a CAT scan, um, but could there be something else going on? I want to spend my last few minutes just talking about perimenopause and menopause and migraine. So, the old school thought was that, okay, you know, I've had bad headaches my whole life, but I'm going to look forward to getting old because my migraines will go away. And the reality is that many of our patients do get better, but sort of one of the little pieces that isn't really shared is that perimenopausally, oftentimes migraine gets a little bit worse. Um, I see a lot of 40, 45 year old, 50 year old women who had really good migraine management and then they hit perimenopause, which is a little bit of a chaotic time hormonally, and all of a sudden their headaches are back in full force, really difficult. And when we think about what's happening, it's sort of like what happened when you first got your period. Your hormones are a little more chaotic, they're not as even, they're not as predictable. And so many of our patients will have far more migraine attacks during that time. And people who have been off prevention and had really good therapy and felt in control may all of a sudden see their headache diaries sort of lighting up with way more headaches. Um, and so this is a time that we need to revisit look at symptoms, you know, what else is going along with these more migraine attacks, how are you doing with caffeine, um, what's your sleep status like, you know, what's your stress level, kind of pulling all those pieces together because they help us choose a therapy that can really help our patients. Again, some patients will introduce hormone at that time, safety may be an issue in that patient, again, looking at um, clotting and risk factors, and certainly with migraine with aura, we're very cautious in these patients. But managing all these pieces around perimenopause is really, really important. And then there is this population of patients that sort of goes into remission once they go through menopause. Um, so one of the questions I'm often asked is, shouldn't I have everything taken out so that I'll be cured? Um, and the answer is no. There actually is a study that was done um, a fairly decent study that looked at, you know, women who had hysterectomies and their ovaries taken out, and actually some of the migraine patients did much worse. And that may be because they no longer have that estrogen base that protects them. You know, that, that steady stays, and you have to take, you know, external estrogen to fight some of the symptoms you get from having a hysterectomy at an early age. So the reality is yanking it all out doesn't work. There are some drugs that can do that as well. And again, they have never been shown to be terribly effective. So the last question I think that comes up is, can I take hormones after menopause? And, and do I want to? And that's a very difficult question for many, many reasons. Um, not just migraines, but also um, 
cancer risk versus protection, bone density risk versus protection, your brain, how that's functioning. Um, and certainly the data isn't clear at this point. The Women's Health Initiative basically scared everybody to death. I could use my <laughs> scared the heck out of everybody. Um, but the reality is it wasn't, you know, they didn't really have good data when they made recommendations to patients. Um, and so it's still sort of an up in the air issue as to, as to what you need to do. And I think for many of my patients, they really base it on how symptomatic they are. You know, so if you're having 20 hot flashes a day, you turn around and you have a hot flash. You know, the dog barks and you have a hot flash. You know, you breathe and you have a hot flash. And you're not sleeping, you know, and you're disabled by these symptoms, then sometimes hormone replacement therapy will be important. But using it and monitoring your headache diary to know what you're doing um, is really, really helpful. And for some patients who, because of breast cancer or other cancer risk should not be on estrogen, there are certainly um, some other remedies that can be useful um, and should be explored. Soy can be helpful, blue and black cohosh can be helpful, um, a few of the SNRIs, drugs like Effexor, sort of indirectly have been found to at least temporarily hot, help with hot flashes. So there are some other options out there if you're not somebody who can take an estrogen-based product, um, you don't have to just suffer. Um, and with that, I'll finish and I'll open the floor to any questions. Thank you very much. worse 
than they did before the hysterectomy. So uh, I, I just want to kind of throw that out there. I wish I would have known this before I had it, but um, I was desperate. Yeah, I, and I'm really sorry that it happened to you. I mean, you, I'm sure there are a few women who do better afterwards, but if you look at the bulk of the literature that we we look at, we don't we don't see that as an improvement. Um, but I agree, people do desperate things when they're having a ton of headaches because of the, you know, okay, this might help. I'll grab it. Um, and and so at least at this point, what I always try to tell my patients is don't don't permanently fix anything in your body, you know, like surgically, because you know there are all kinds of implantable things that, are, you know, and I always say, you know, whatever it is, you want it to be reversible because we don't have those answers yet. We just don't have enough information. And I don't say that cavalierly. I get it how much people suffer and how difficult it is because, you know, going on a search for that right answer, and it's usually not just one right answer. It's having a, a, a program that works for you when you have that bad migraine. So I wish you a lot of luck. Anybody else have a question of this lady over here? You're getting exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I had a total hysterectomy for medical reasons, not headaches. I've always been kind of susceptible to headaches of all kinds. But um, he put me on an estrogen cream, and because of my age now, he wants to move me off that a little bit. Am I going to be more susceptible to headaches, possibly? It, it's possible, although you're not, you haven't had a lot, so you'd probably be okay. I always tell people to do a gradual change, just kind of to let your brain get used to it, you know, just makes sort of sense. So if you're using, you know, and the hard thing with creams is how much are you getting, what's your dose that you're absorbing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but but I think if you make that change gradually, it's certainly more effective and, and your brain will be happier doing that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions about that? I have a question. Um, I'm gonna, um, birth control pills because at my age I was spent having children and I went to chronic migraines like almost overnight and we dealt with them, dealt with them, tried to figure it out and then I went back on birth control pills to even out my estrogen and now the chronic migraines seem to be easing up. I was just wondering why that might be. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean certainly the estrogen based compounds as I said before can definitely be a trigger to set it off. Um, you may be on a different level right now of compound, and also as you get older, your brain reacts differently to the estrogen type compounds. You, you know, so it could be the dose you're on. Um, it could be you know just, and you're not old, but you know the aging as your brain gets older, it reacts differently to the hormonal. You know, because you have estrogen receptors up there, and so it may be reacting differently, and. Not to get too complicated, but there are three kinds of estrogen your body makes. So it may be the complement of those hormones that are in your body from that pill that you're taking that's different from what your pill was before. So it's always really hard to measure these things. Because it's the brain, we can't really look at it quite as sensitively as some of our other organs. Um, but it's probably a combination of those factors, age and what you know, the specific compound that you're on right now, I would guess. Anybody else have any questions later? Hi. How much of an effect does caffeine have, especially if you're in menopause related to the estrogen, or does it at all? Well, it doesn't have a direct effect on estrogen, so I'm sorry if I alluded to that, that I'm aware of, right? Caffeine doesn't have a direct effect. Okay. But, it, but, but here's the issue with caffeine and menopause. Um, uh, caffeine will exacerbate hot flashes. Caffeine will exacerbate sleeplessness. So, you know, if you think of the two most predictable symptoms of menopause, caffeine makes it worse. And then independently, caffeine is a risk factor for migraine. So the old wives' tale is drink caffeine with your aspirin and your headache will go away. And that's actually true but it depends how much caffeine you do. So if you're a caffeine junkie, which of course is defined differently by different people, I'm kind of rigid about that caffeine, 
But um, if you're, as I'm drinking my caffeine, right? Uh, that's caffeine. I gotta be honest, it's coming. <laughs> but it's half and half. It's half and half. Um, but but if you if you live on caffeine and you have probably over a hundred or so milligrams in your body at any one time, it can be an independent risk factor for chronification, which sounds like a really big term. But in reality, what that means is if you do too much caffeine, it can lead you to have chronic migraine. You know, it's a good rule of thumb. And while I don't think that's the single entity that makes patients worse, it certainly can play a role. And all you have to do is tell somebody who abuses caffeine, I'm going to take away your caffeine. And if I don't say slowly, they go, no, I've always been way worse when I've done that. So they've tested it. It's almost like being an alcoholic. <laughs> it's like they can't let it go, right? But, uh, but it's really, really important because you can't get better sometimes if you don't take away those pieces. And certainly if you're in menopause where you're not sleeping and you're having hot flashes, it you know, makes sense. But I always tell people to wean it slowly. You know, and I don't care if it takes you a month, month and a half. And again, as the single entity, I don't necessarily think it's going to fix you. But it will certainly help you respond to other medication, make your medicine work better, give you less medication overuse or rebound headaches. I mean, I think it has, and then you can use it as a medicine. You know, then you can add it back in with something to make it work better. But when you have so much on board, it's not terribly helpful. You had talked about um, migraines during pregnancy usually getting better. Um, usually. Usually. And I recently had a baby and I was um, in bed for 13 weeks um, with migraines. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about migraines that get worse during pregnancy and then if I were to get pregnant again, what the likelihood of me having that same Sure. Situation. And I'm sorry you were so sick during your pregnancy. That's really hard. Um, yeah, so, so about, if you look at the old data, about 60% of patients improve with pregnancy. But that's really old stuff. You know, that's like from studies that were done when I was a child, you know, a long time ago. Um, so, so if you look at newer data, I, I still think many women do improve with pregnancy, not necessarily in the first trimester, but usually somewhere around 14 to 16 weeks. That's not 100%. There's still probably about 20 to 30% of our patients who struggle. And that's a large number when you look at the population that has migraine. Um, I think the other thing that gets tough is, you know, a lot of physicians and healthcare providers don't want to medicate it, right? And if they do medicate it, what are the safe products and what will break the headache, right? And let you get going again. And so there are preventative things you can use during pregnancy, and I don't know if you were on any, and that's your personal story, obviously, um, but there are preventative things you could take if you wanted to that would have worked, potentially. There are also acute medicines that we use. So for example, a couple months ago, I had a lady who was about 18 weeks who came here from Kentucky, and we used some IV therapy and broke the cycle she was in, and you know she didn't have any more headaches during her cycle. So there are things that are safe that you can use if you have to, okay? Obviously, all of us would like it to be as clean as possible and with as little drug as possible. But, so that's, you know, the one piece. The second piece is what happens next time? And the answer is one cannot predict for sure, but just because you had one difficult pregnancy doesn't mean you won't have another one. Um, and, and I think each one individually, in my patients, at least clinically, and I have to tell you, there aren't a lot of studies looking, in fact, there are no studies looking at this data. If you had chronic migraine during pregnancy one, will you have it in pregnancy two? And the answer is nobody knows, okay? What I would tell you from my clinical experience, having treated a lot of women over the last 20-something years who are pregnant, um, is that there is no predicting. I, I would predict that you'll have some attacks, but you won't be in the same place. Okay? And that you may want to talk to a genetic pharmacologist before you do this, because that will help you to navigate what's safe and what isn't safe. You know, I don't know your story again, but you know, there are certainly options so that you don't have to be in bed, and that they're safe for you and the baby. Did you have a boy or a girl? Congratulations. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.
you want to start it? Yeah.